<laughs> All right. Happy New Year, everyone. Today I'm talking about loving the church. And if we do this right, um, this will hopefully impact us, not just as a church, but as individuals. Um, because we're talking about identity. We're talking about community today. We're talking about what makes us who we are. Who's seen this movie? <laughs> Why is this room in Asian America and um, Asians and other countries too? Why were they so infatuated with this movie? Identity, right? For a lot of people, it was the first time seeing Asian Americans casted as main characters in a story. So whether you're Christian, non-Christian, whether you're old or young, whether you're rich or poor, this movie felt like it was part of us, right? So as a community, kind of all went out to see it. Problem with, it, with a thing like a movie is that it ends just as a movie. It's just a story that ends. Um, what we're doing today is we're doing church. We are an eternal community. People in this room, we're going to be joined together in heaven with Jesus Christ forever. And so we understand that a part of our hearts longs to be included. A part of our hearts longs to be seen and known by God and by each other. I first came to church about 20 something years ago. Um, I went to church in LA, in Arcadia. And um, my parents are from Shanghai. My, my parents moved to the US, to Phoenix, Arizona. And I grew up as an Asian kid in a very white world. And then when my parents got divorced, I went to live with my mom in Arcadia. And I was kind of alone, didn't really have a community, but for the first time there were Asians around, right? And I'm like, how do I figure out part of my identity? Well, across the street from me, there was a church. Right? It was a United Methodist Church, and they had a Chinese church on their a sharing facility with them. And so I walked across the street, and I started going to church by myself. <coughs> what was amazing is that there were Asian Americans speaking English. <laughs> like, this is like nothing to you guys, right? But growing up in Arizona, that meant a lot. And the people who welcomed me in, they were older. They're my, they're my parents' age. That's why my mom was comfortable being, going across the street. My mom met some of the leaders. And I was comfortable because they were speaking English. And they had kids who looked like me, Asian Americans. And for the first time, I felt like I had a community. Inclusion is a powerful thing. If it were not for older and younger people who understood who I was as a person and the hurts of a divorced kid, I probably wouldn't be at church. When people see you for who you are, right? And somehow that seeing, it's a little bit of how God sees you. It helps you to understand that the church really is a community of God. And this story is not unique to my situation in Arcadia 20 years ago. This story is an ongoing story of the church. For thousands of years, for the history of the church, race, ethnicity, gender, rich, poor, these, all these different issues of identity have been plagues in the church, have been blessings in the church, have been conflicts in the church. In the early church, Right, really, really early, Israelites. God set himself, himself a part of people. Right? A people, and he said, okay, you are Abraham's seed. Your identity is a descendant of Abraham. And to solidify your identity, we're going to make you eat certain things, wear certain things, worship on certain days, don't do certain things. And then they preserve that identity throughout Egypt into the Exodus, and when they became a kingdom and all these things, even through occupations of different powers, and we get to the New Testament. We get to the New Testament, where this people called out by God, who have survived for thousands of years in this identity that God has given them, and God changes it. Something happens in Acts. Something happens in the early church. To be saved, you, don't, you no longer have to be Jewish. To be saved, you can have this wide identity. And, that, and that's an issue that became a huge issue throughout the early church. And you see it all throughout Paul's letters, right? You see it, the apostles themselves wrestled with this. Let's get to the Bible. 
Paul, in, in his books of Romans, stop passing judgment on one another. Make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister, because I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is <coughs> unclean. When this huge influx of people who wanted to follow Jesus came into the church, they brought all their different ideas and thoughts and identity issues into the church. And the leaders of the church, the leaders that God appointed, had to write to the church this. We need to stop passing judgment. All right? I understand that for thousands of years, you had to keep yourselves clean, not defiled by the surrounding nations. Something changes. But now, instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Why? Because I'm convinced I am fully persuaded in Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But if, and when we regard something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. You might read this and like, this is like direct contradiction to Levitical law. <laughs> this is direct contradiction to the thousands of years of history that the people of God have experienced. What do you mean nothing's unclean? Of course things are unclean. You told us things were unclean. But Paul says this, but I'm convinced by Jesus Christ, that nothing is unclean in itself. Something changes with Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came, and he died, and he resurrected, and he brought new life, when he heals Samaritans, when he heals people who are not of the Jewish people, something changes. So now, what you start to see in the New Testament is, everyone can come to God. That, hey, church, hey, Jewish court, Understand that something's happening. What you used to regard as filthy and unclean is now clean. Here's artwork to help you understand that. This is this is artwork done by my team, Chinese block style. Um, I want you guys to go back and read Romans 10 for yourself. I'm going to tell you the story of Romans 10 and what this picture is. Peter is the leader of the Jewish church, right? The Apostle Peter, and he himself struggles. It continues to struggle if you read the Bible uh, with this huge influx of Gentiles coming to Christ. So in Romans 10, we know that there is a story about Peter, right? He, he, gets, he gets a vision. He gets a vision that a sheep comes down from heaven full of unclean animals, animals he's not supposed to touch. And God says to him, eat. And Peter's like, hold on, this is a trick. This is a trick. I know the Bible. The Bible's like, do not eat these things. They're unclean. And God says to them, do not call them unclean. I have made them clean. It's not really about food. <laughs> because at the same time, at the same time, a Roman, a centurion, a soldier, a person you would actually probably think might be an evil person because he works for the Roman government, a commander of a hundred, a centurion, also hears from God at the same time. He also has a vision to invite Peter into his house. And the Bible tells us that Peter and this Roman, they meet. And Peter starts to see the Holy Spirit being brought down from heaven onto the people. And Peter sees that these people truly are followers of God. You guys might just see this as an as a everyday story. This is a monumental story in the life of the church. The Apostle Peter, the leader of the church, we built basilicas called St. Peter's Basilica and all that stuff, right? Very early on in the life of the church, he meets with Romans, and he declares for all of history to see the Gentiles are also the people of God. And that's why most of you guys here are not Jewish, <laughs> and that's okay. Right? Because God himself and the leaders of the church have said to a lot of Chinese and Asians and different others in here, you are not unclean. That you are not unclean. Don't take that for granted. That's still an issue we face today in missions. The issue of are Asians unclean? Are Muslims unclean? Are those from this age group, gender, socioeconomic bracket, are they unclean? God himself 
says that he has an agent claim. And in church history, the leaders of the church from God have heard that you are made clear. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting for love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. The kingdom of God is not about what you eat or drink. And that's a huge issue because you do it so often, right? It's, you do it so, like, every ethnicity, when you really break it down, like, when you think of, you know, um, Chinese culture, it's a lot of people think of Chinese food. That's okay. <laughs> Mexican culture in San Diego, how you interact with it is usually through Mexican food. That's okay. Eating and drinking has always been a part of culture. Do not be distressed. When you come across a different culture, and something bothers you. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. There's, there's two parts of this. One is judging others, and one is standing up for yourself, uh, for your own culture. Do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. Standing up, standing up for your own culture. The kingdom of God is not about just the trappings of what you grew up with, of the eating and drinking. But if this is the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, joy, in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. How do we as a church love each other, love the community? Love our families and people we still want to invite to church. See them in this way. See them in the way that God created them uniquely to not judge people when they want to express their devotion for God in a certain way. And understand this, when they truly come to God, they'll eat the same things, they might dress the same way, they might watch the same movies, but this will change. You'll see righteousness. You will see peace and you will see joy in the Holy Spirit. If we're seeking for those things in this church, if we're seeking for righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit in this church, and our joy and our happiness is in that in this church, we can learn to be inclusive. We can learn to invite our families and our communities here. Right? We can truly worship God in this place. But life isn't easy, so let me, let me give you a story. This is me in Shanghai. And this is not a, it's not impressive, right? It's just me in the living room. This is me in a, in a small living room, and we're holding a retreat uh, for orphans that we've been serving for about 15 years. My first goal when I came to Shanghai was to do something much more glamorous than this. Um, because I'm buff. <laughs> All right, I've been bodybuilding for a bunch of years. And so my goal when I first did, started doing missions is I wanted to leverage all my Shanghainese powers of being able to speak the language, but also being American and having access to like American businessmen to open a gym, right? I wanted to open a gym and I wanted to be super fancy because Americans like fancy things. And I wanted to turn the gym into a place where we can also have church and stuff, right? Um, but since I, since I was doing it, I also wanted it to be like two stories, a bunch of new equipment, hire really smart people and all that stuff. And I, I try to pursue that plan for, for years and years, and a lot of doors open and stuff like that. And something changed along the way as I was trying to open my gym, um, and I brought some of some people in this church who were interested in fitness to help me out. One of the things that changed as I started working with orphans and those with special needs is I started to realize, like, I don't necessarily need a gym to accomplish this. Having, like, a really expensive space and having like fancy equipment and all that stuff doesn't actually help me reach more orphans and those special needs, right? And so after years and years, I, I kept thinking like, I kept pushing for the gym idea, I kept pushing for fitness, because I like fitness. And as I was serving orphans, I'm like, this whole idea I have is actually not really beneficial to actually me doing missions. <clears throat> so why do I keep pushing for this idea? 
because my parents owned a restaurant in Arizona for 20 years, and they taught me to love business. Because a part of me is Shanghainese, the rich Shanghainese, and part of me is American. I grew up in LA, so I like fancy things. And this whole part of me, this whole dream of mine, so much of it was captured by my culture and upbringing that I couldn't, I couldn't divorce it. So even though God had given me a vision for reaching people who I really cared about, I really wanted to serve, a part of me still valued, right? Like these things that were given to me by my parents, these things that I learned in LA. What makes it hard in the church to be inclusive? What makes it hard to love each other, to love our families, to love our community? A lot of our value sets we bring to the church, not necessarily good or evil, but sometimes they're unhelpful. <laughs> right? I'm going to yeah, say it again. It's not good or evil. Sometimes it's unhelpful. I know why my parents opened a business in Arizona. It's because how to get a visa and how we, now how I went to school and stuff like that. I don't hate that. I don't hate my parents teaching me business. I don't hate growing up in LA and like learning about media and stuff like that. I love that stuff. But as I moved towards helping orphans and those special needs, not everything was helpful going forward. I realized that so much of my identity and my value set was tied in that, but going forward to who I wanted to be, it wasn't helpful. I think that's, I think that's one of the issues we have, right, as people. As people, I think we, we try to turn righteousness, getting back to Romans, we try to turn righteousness into our cultural value sets. 2,000 years ago, do you eat kosher food? Do you eat pig? Do you eat pork? Oh, that's, you're not righteous. And Gentiles are like, I don't see how me being a Christian is about eating pork. They thought it was unhelpful. That by making their following Jesus about eating pork and not eating pork became unhelpful to them going to small group and going to church and all that stuff. What are we to do as a church? I'm not saying we forsake our identity. We recognize it for what it is. But understand that us as a church, there is a journey that we've all been on for thousands of years. And that journey is, how do we see people the way God sees them? And to be careful that we have this lens of our culture and upbringing, that's not good or bad, it's just what it is, it is a lens. And sometimes it's unhelpful in how we interact with them. The Bible's going to help us out with this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing, the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is. It's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do not conform because there's a pattern of this world. There's a pattern of what the world deems as good. I got so much encouragement from other missionaries and Christians and people in this church like Dave, David, you're the, you're the man for this gym. All right? My Shanghai house friends are like, dude, you are the man for this gym. Like you're meant to be a bodybuilder and you have business experience for this moment. And as I was working more and more with orphans, I'm like, this is not helpful. I keep pushing for this thing. And you guys, everyone's telling me that it's it's really good, but it's not helpful. I was conforming to a pattern. I was conforming to a pattern. Here's what I had to do and had to go on. I had to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. All of us have been transformed by the renewing of our mind. As we see God more clearly, as we interact with those we serve with, we become changed. We become changed. If we're really serving, if we're really loving, we become changed. Peter became changed. The Apostle Paul became changed. The Jewish church became changed. You know how I know that? Because the early church writings after the period of the apostles were mostly non-Jewish. <laughs> right? Think back to what you know. Most of the stuff you hear from the early church after the apostles were mostly non-Jewish. The church became changed by Gentiles. And you see this huge church grow up and the Jewish are like, I sign up on that. You guys are awesome. They were transformed. Their minds were renewed. 
these people who are not of God can all of a sudden be leaders in the church. If we are transformed, then you will be able to test and improve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let me help you with that, in case you're not sure what that is. God's will is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his son that none should perish. But that if you believe in Jesus, the way the Jews believe and follow Jesus, then you will be saved. That's his will. That's why we exist. That's why we are a church. So what is our mission? To bring people to know Jesus. And what is our challenge? Is that we have this lens up. Right? We have this way of looking at the world, given to us by our parents, by ourselves, and the places we grew up with. They're not helpful. And a lot of times it's hurtful. Right? If we're honest with ourselves, like the generation gap, you know, in every ethnicity, not just Asians, right, is like it's painful. Like when I had conversations with my mom about Shanghai, she wanted me to like be rich and stuff. And when I went to seminary, she wanted me to go to Stanford, or Stanford and Princeton, because they're like big name schools. And it caused, it caused me to have a rift with her. <coughs> and so th this challenge we have, right, is a heart challenge and a head challenge. There's no easy answer to that. The answer to that and the solution to that is this. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing. The process of your mind being changed. Here's a helpful tip. Be patient. We're all on a journey. We're all being renewed by God constantly. How do we work through culture? Patience, love, understanding, tolerance. Be long-suffering. This is my son, Jeremiah, who was born eight months ago. This, this picture is a representation of my life. It's Shanghai, the UCSD library, that's Budapest in the background. When I, when I think about myself and my parents and what they went through, and my son now, who's gonna grow up in San Diego, <clears throat> and I think about church, I, I wonder if Jeremiah could come to a church and be loved the way I was loved when I was about 10 years old. Right? A kid of divorced parents, a kid struggling to find an identity. I wonder if a church like this would be welcoming of Jeremiah. Because when, when I was 10, I had a lot of issues with my, my own parents. Right? My parents weren't there for me, and I had a lot of issues trying to figure out who I was. I wonder if this church, if Jeremiah was struggling through some of those same issues, that we would be welcoming of a person like that. It's a blessing to you guys, too. When you guys look at the future leaders of your church, when you guys look at the next five years even, we're going to have a lot of people who are working through their issues. So what do we do? Be patient. I'm, thank I'm thankful for everyone in the church, because a lot of you have known for over 10 years now. And you know, when I, when I was in college, when I was dating my, my now wife, I was working through issues. And that's, a lot of our biggest issues are with our cultural identity. Such, right? And a lot of people in this church were patient with, with me. I hope that as a culture, we would learn that. As a culture, we would continue to be patient and loving and accepting to understand that it's a blessing to you too. All right, I'm thankful that you guys allowed me to serve you in this way by preaching this morning. And I'm able to do this only because you were patient with me over years and years. Because you were loving to me. All right, even the last recent months, with Jeremiah being born and our life being thrown upside down, right? you guys were loving. You guys were loving to a new parent trying to figure it out, learning a new culture. I'm thankful that there's so many parents teaching me with the language of being a parent and stuff. But the challenge we have going forward is this. San Diego, this community, the communities that we're part of, it's getting more complicated. There are more ages. There are more women. There are more socioeconomic brackets and ethnicities and all different identities around us. How do we as a church love each other and love the community? Let's be renewed. 
Let's go on this journey that God has us on. Let's not fight it and be angry and bitterness. I understand that there is hurt. When we talk about identity, there's always going to be hurt. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Because Jesus died and gave himself up for his church. He gave us new life in the church. And here's the hope that I hope you guys embrace. For thousands of years, the church has been expanding. The church today in 2019 is the most diverse church the world has ever known. In 2019, the church has more women leaders, kid leaders, old leaders, middle-aged leaders than ever before. It has more languages than has ever existed in the church. So we're all part of this journey. I invite you to ask for healing. Right? Because if I just say this to you, you're going to be like, well, that's nice, but my life is still hurt. All right? In a lot of ways, I'll still be hurt by my parents. They're, they'll keep reminding me of my, not opening my gym. Let's be patient. Let's be loving. Let's look at Jesus, who is our comfort. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for every single person in this room. God, I thank you for every family, for every individual, um, for every person who has experienced your love and grace in their life. And Lord, I ask that you continue to be with us on this journey, that you continue to renew our minds and our hearts, and help us to be people um, who feel the way we've been accepted, and to ex extend that acceptance and love to others. God, we invite you here in this place. Be present. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.